there was Burning Man. It's in the middle of the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, uh, Alkali Lake, and it's very dusty and very dry. So in a way, it was a bit of a sort of uh, acclimatization for me over the years. And so I didn't find that to be as much of a culture shock or a shock in terms of being there. In fact, I felt quite at home in, in that sense. Again, sort of looking at the, uh, and, and I think one of the things, of course, as part of the program is uh, trying to absorb as much as you can. And for me, it was taking a lot of images, uh, talking to a lot of uh, the people on the base, uh, which I found, and, and again, people were, or a lot of the uh, personnel were incredibly generous with what they shared with me and, and such. Uh, so I found that really quite interesting. And then a smaller drone, and uh, I often find this, uh, the drawing of caricatures on these, on these uh, weapons is, is quite interesting. Uh, the tour of the base itself and the outskirts of the base is, a lot of it, it was mined. So over the years, uh, they have been uh, system uh, systematically demining a lot of the air, but still it's quite uh, dangerous. And, and so uh, uh, it was an interesting sort of uh, tour of the outer sort of perimeter of uh, Kandahar. And of course, the, um, the uh, uh, mine sort of uh, sign in itself in the grass. Uh, again, and you might know what uh, armored vehicle this is. It was over by the medical. Okay, that's on the left. Okay, and uh, so uh, they allowed me to uh, to drive that one afternoon. Uh, this is the medical facilities. Uh, this is one of the images that I uh, would put on uh, exhibition. Uh, again, got the uh, tour of the medical facilities and the holding areas uh, for the uh, injured, and um, and I thought that was uh, yeah very uh, very poignant and. It was interesting because, you know, I asked one of the doctors, you know, just about his experience and stuff like that, and was just sort of telling me that, you know, in terms of uh, times of the year and, and, you know, of course, around the holidays, around Christmas and New Year's, he said, oh, that was always the hardest, especially in dealing with casualties and also that sense of being away from home and, and such. So, so, you know, the human sort of aspects of, of, of conflict and war and, you know, what, that, what does that do to us as, as human beings? Another one I thought was interesting, and, and again, the, uh, the, bombs, the bomb squad at Kandahar on their daily run. <laughs> so I thought, oh my gosh. Not only is it like, uh, it, uh, there are in, the th I think that there's about 35 or 40 degrees uh, centigrade, and they're all like suited up, and <laughs> what a good way to get in shape real quick. <laughs> and again, so this is Massive Guard. So it's actually uh, mountainous, uh, interspersed with sort of, uh, um, wide plains and such. So Mass Garden itself is sort of situated on this sort of mountain. Uh, so the mountain itself sort of feels like this fortified sort of, sort of uh, space. And so we went overland uh, to Mass um, They were actually pretty careful with me once I got there in the sense that I wasn't allowed to leave the base, and rightfully so. Uh, months before I went there, the uh, journalist uh, Michelle Lang from Calgary uh, was killed, and so that uh, led to a lot more sort of tightening up of making sure that uh, civilians like myself, who uh, went into the theater of war, uh, were, uh, were, were taken care of. And for that, I'm eternally uh, grateful uh, for their care. Uh, so while there, and, and for me again, I'm always, I, I, I find landscapes incredibly interesting. And for me, to be in such a beautiful country and a beautiful space, juxtaposed with the conflict and, 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 and the forward operating base and stuff was sort of going back and forth and back and forth. So I found that really sort of one of those sort of internal sort of dialogues about, about, about the theater and, and about what, you know, what does this all mean? So this one is from March 19th. Woke up at about 1900 hours, then headed off to the mess, where it was bingo night. Oh, this is actually in um, a camp garage. Which brought a big smile to my face. I grabbed a quick bite, checked out Zombieland on the big screen outside with the crescent moon overhead. Very cool. I'm thinking of Burning Man and the similarities to this landscape. There are many things going on in this camp tonight. People playing bingo, watching TV, watching movies, playing games, or just hanging out. I saw the memorial plaques. 
which brings home the reality of being here. I can hear the call to the mosque, mixed with an American TV series soundtrack. Weird. I leave for Afghanistan at 7.40 tomorrow morning. March 23rd, uh, 5.51 in the morning, morning at Nasogar. Waiting for the sun to rise over the jagged peaks, a rooster crowing in the distance, a woman in a white shawl rides her bike, cool, crisp morning air, the hum of the generators behind, voices in the town, waking up, a bark, dark to soft definitions within the mud brick huts, sandbag sentries. Morning rays begin to slide down the slopes, cutting the dust into lines. An Afghan army officer with a gun comes my way, checks me out. I show him my camera and say, sunrise, I say. He smiles and goes on his way. His features are beautiful. Life begins to stir. A man in his backyard performs his morning ritual. Birds calling the sun, smoke from the homes rising. My host, the Master Corporal Jamie Gilman, just visited. He mentioned that there was an explosion at about uh, 2,300 hours last night. We'll hear what it was today. And the shots we heard last night were from battle or a tick troops in contact. So again, the images and, and the sort of the juxtaposition between the village life and the operation of the Canadian military. And uh, quite often during the day, little sorties would go out and, and then would come back at different times. Um, to the north of us was another town, and there was a lot of active uh, engagement going on, and quite often you'd hear uh, guns, and then uh, uh, on one day I saw huge plumes of smoke, so obviously there was bombing going on. Um, and then the constant sound of drones uh, were, were overhead. You sometimes see them and sometimes not. And then of course the helicopters and the Apache helicopters and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this was an interesting image uh, in terms of the, the juxtaposition. And this was also part of the, uh, 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 the exit, one of the exhibitions I, uh, I was a part of. Massengar proper. And, Terms of. And that's the other thing too, containers. You know, I, I, I often think about that in terms of, uh, of course, everything is shipped in containers these days. Now containers are becoming a very big part of our lives. And certainly in the theater of war, how they were everywhere. And they become the infrastructure of a city. And in that in itself is a really interesting investigation, I, uh, I thought. Uh, this is to, uh, this is Padway, the town uh, north, or no, sorry, east. Uh, Massengar. So a lot of agriculture uh, happening in, in and around the area, which I thought was quite, uh, and, and again, just continuing. Life continues in spite, and that was one of the things that I, I really sort of, sort of struck, uh, struck me. Uh, the bubble, this was the area where the soldiers uh, um, uh, slept in their bunks, again in containers, <laughs> which uh, was really interesting. And just sort of the day, you know, again, the daily lives. And I often find it that things went from sort of really sort of mundane and, and quiet and almost boring in a sense uh, to chaotic. And all of a sudden things would just become chaotic. And uh, so I found that uh, an interesting sort of, sort of space. Uh, this was to the south uh, of us, uh, again, up on the uh, top of the uh, mountaintop. The area there had just recently had been uh, cleared of mines, and uh, they had uh, called it uh, IED Lane. Uh, one of the helicopters overhead that uh, went by. Another interesting story that uh, when I was transported between Kandahar and Masamgar uh, in this sort of dark space, uh, there was another uh, fellow with this dog, this bomb dog, that uh, came along <coughs> that were uh, heading out to Masamgar. And so I got to, to ride with that dog. And for the Blackfoot people, uh, dogs are sacred. And uh, for me, the sense of these sort of uh, serendipity or how things happen, uh, I find very interesting. And the fact that the dog was, was with, with me greatly gave me great comfort. And so I found that uh, very interesting. And, and uh, I am an animal lover and I have dogs, so. <laughs> so I thought that, uh, you know, they, they are. They're, they're part of the troops. 
in so many ways, and I think that uh, that's something that uh, that I'll also gain when you think about the things that you observe and the sort of lines of investigation and what you can create from that work. There, there is so much, and, and certainly historical. So that was one of the uh, um, installations. Uh, uh, every gallery I went to uh, allowed me to draw on their walls. So these are actually drawings on their walls. And, uh, so uh, this is the Apache helicopter and the uh, bomb dog. Uh, but uh, it was also interesting too because you know in, in, uh, a lot of these vehicles and stuff uh, have indigenous based names like Chinook, Apache. You know when you think about these things, it's like okay, that's interesting too. <laughs> so again, and I'm sure historically there's reasons. And it's one of the things that I'm very interested in also understanding or coming to know. But also on the base too were were local local uh, community dogs uh, that uh, found their way onto the base and were basically adopted. Uh, uh, this one had a, a litter of pups, and uh, they fed her quite often. And uh, this is a north, again, a north view uh, uh, at Massengard. Uh, sorry, south view again. And it was uh, interesting because uh, it, its strategic position, uh, Massengard, on that mountain, sort of in itself, is fortified, and, you know, by the mountain itself. I was actually surprised that you know that I wouldn't see like major barriers and stuff like that. And yes, there's razor wire and, and such all, all around and stuff uh, as a deterrent uh, to get onto the base, uh, and then other fences down further. Uh, but generally, I felt it was pretty exposed in, in reality, in my mind. But nonetheless, I'm sure there were a lot of other things going on that I, I was unaware of. And again, the juxtapositions. Uh, to the north, and that was the uh, 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 the city or the town that was often the site of a lot of uh, conflict or, or ticks. Uh, and then the river that uh, ran between uh, Massengar and that particular uh, settlement of that town. And this, I, again, uh, when I was thinking of bar uh, barriers and walls, I thought <laughs> there would be more of these, and so I uh, took some images of these, again, juxtaposed with the, uh, with the landscape itself. Uh, this was the only time I got into a little bit of trouble uh, on the base. Because, <laughs> again, they did really allow me to, and I asked, too. I said, you know, are there places I can go and places I can't go? <laughs> and they said, oh, no, you should be all right. And so, of course, I'm wandering around doing video, and I go to the uh, west, and that's where the um, artillery ranges, where they do shooting and stuff like that internally in the, uh, in the camp. And so I was up there sort of wandering around and I, I think I don't know who would be uh, the commander of the base or what would, what would, I think it would be the commander of the base. I think caught sight of me doing that and sort of gave, sort of said, who is this? I thought, well, you knew I was there, but I'm sure it was, uh, it was like, well, maybe you shouldn't be up there. <laughs> Probably more for my own safety than anything, because it was pretty high and exposed in, in a sense uh, from below. Uh, a lot of communication uh, towers uh, 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 throughout uh, Massengar. And, uh, and, and generally, it was interesting. The weather was usually often blue skies and, and pretty warm, but every now and then uh, there would be a bit of a sort of a fog that would come in, that was, uh, uh, which was interesting. And also the little dust storms. I thought that was cool. And then again, some of the drawings, and you know, that I started to do just very light pencil drawings of the landscape, which became part of uh, part of the exhibitions down the road. Um, and that sort of really sort of sort of made me think about the relationship to historical war artists being in the field and, and sort of just doing drawings and, and I was thinking about that as I, as I was, I was doing this. Which leads me, because as originally, as I mentioned, my intent was to just record the daily lives of the soldiers and the bases themselves, which I did. But I don't know, and it's still to this day, and I'm, I'm going to ask Master Corporal Jamie Gilman, Gilman uh, if he was uh, directed specifically to me because he was an indigenous soldier. But certainly for me, it was certain, again, one of those serendipitous moments, which led me in a whole new direction of uh, looking at indigenous participation in uh, the military, in the Canadian military. And this particular installation is called 10,000 Plus because it is estimated that there are 10,000 indigenous uh, soldiers in the Canadian military, and I say plus, because uh, many of those uh, uh, didn't identify as First Nations. 
So it's probably a larger number than that. And so for me, I met two indigenous soldiers at Massengar, Master Corporal Jamie Gilman, who was from the Gordon's First Nation. So again, another very interesting sort of connection. And Corporal uh, Percy Bedard, and he was one of the cooks uh, on the base. So I got to meet those two gentlemen. And, uh, and we talked about, um, about uh, indigenous uh, history in the military. And so I did decide to do this, and it was interesting, again, um, the transport that brought me in also brought the mail to the soldiers. And an elder back in Saskatchewan had sent Master Corporal Jamie Gilman uh, the four medicines of tobacco, sweet grass, sage, and um, tobacco, sage, and cedar. And so uh, that came in with me. So uh, he asked when I arrived, for the arrived if I, if I wanted to smudge with him. Uh, as, as I came in with this, the medicines. And again, you wonder about these things, and especially from an indigenous perspective and how these things uh, unfold. And so this, on each one of those little shelves, uh, which each, which, um, was each of those medicines, and directly relate to that story in relation to Master Corporal Jamie Gilman. And that's Master Corporal uh, on this side, and uh, Percy Bedard on the other side. Oh geez, I have to stop already, sorry. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so I'll go on for a bit, uh, getting close to the end. And uh, here's Master Corporal, uh, Jamie Gilman. And uh, he really was my guide and uh, took care of me on the, on the base. I had many interesting discussions. He's also involved with Bold Eagle uh, here in Canada and, uh, and such. And so uh, it was a great uh, resource and uh, a protector of me on the base. So I ended up taking a lot of images of, of him uh, and then uh, using those for the uh, portraits and, and such. Then just a little close up of the, of the medicines. And then uh, Percy Bedard. And then I had originally um, uh, taken the portraits and, and sort of created backgrounds for them in color. And I wasn't, uh, I, I exhibited these at that time, but then I just decided to just do the red background. And I'm still debating why I did that. And I think for me, of course, red has the connotation of emergency and alert and blood and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, I thought maybe that something that was in the back of my mind. Again, moving back and forward juxtaposition, the crops, the transporting in of goods, and I believe that was a Russian hel a helicopter. Yeah, which was interesting. It was really fun, it was really uh, lovely uh, to watch the uh, goat herders, and the sheep herders. Every morning they would, from the village, they would take the goats out to the field, and then every evening they'd bring them back in. So it was this routine that I watched every day, and I did a, a, a bit of video of it, and, and, and thought it was a it was, it was a beautiful sort of sort of sight. Little signs, one painted on one of the uh, tanks, a bison. <laughs> so again, these relationships that keep coming forward that I thought were quite interesting. Um, Massengar, this is the the big flag, but just below the flag uh, are the stones of the fallen soldiers and the conflict uh, from that base. So again, those. Those moments of, uh, of, of, of sort of realizing where, you're, where you are and the cost. Uh, evening at Massengar. And then towards the end of it, uh, we were uh, taken out by U.S. Uh, Chinook uh, helicopter. And that was my, basically my uh, time at Massengar. And uh, again, and on, upon return, and that's why I kept my journal, is to go back and sort of recount and sort of think about those experiences and, 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 and what they meant and how they were to me. So this would be on uh, March 25th, 20, uh, 2140 hours. The dust blows furiously around us. The chopper blades pick up the dust and small gravel hit, hits us. Things move quickly. I follow those soldiers in a line being directed by the chopper commandant as I get behind to enter. The heat from the engines blasts me. I step up, step up onto the platform to get, get in. 
thoughts of every Vietnam movie I have seen flash through my mind. This is an American Chinook helicopter, complete with gunners. We rush in, grab a seat, we are sideways. We are all in and suddenly we rise. I look out the back, massive guard fades into the distance. We pitch and turn over the mountains, we fly uh, to the other base and pick up more soldiers, we fly back, back to Kandahar. And so that really sort of ended my experience there. So the remaining images, this was inside the, uh, in the Chinook helicopter. Another one of the images. The landscape below. And then uh, back to Kandahar. And we said to spend a little bit of time there uh, debriefing, and it just so happened the Canadian uh, hockey team, Lanny McDonald, and all those, uh, our, our hockey stars came in, and uh, they had uh, a big, uh, there's a big um, uh, uh, a rink that they uh, built it down to Har, so often there'd be uh, sort of uh, field hockey games that uh, happened there. So all those, any uh, uh, um, uh, because <laughs> watch how much I watch sports. <laughs> NHL uh, uh, hockey uh, uh, stars were there to, uh, to support the troops and, uh, and be there. And they've even brought the, the Grey Cup. So I'd never seen the Grey Cup in my life until the Kandahar. <laughs> so that was kind of, kind of interesting. And again, the fortification and then the leaving. So once I got back, I, put all, I, I took all the information and... Uh, had the first exhibition in Regina at Neutral Ground, and then also the Grunt Gallery in Vancouver, and that was the exhibition I called Holding Our Breath, and created installations uh, and uh, work for, for that exhibition. And then Christine Connolly from here in Ottawa, uh, she, uh, curator, uh, created another exhibition called Terms of Engagement, and myself, Nicola Feldman Kiss, and Dick Abrams uh, were all part of that that traveled uh, to Kingston, Calgary, and uh, Halifax. So that was another one. And then so for research, doing a lot of reading and stuff, so often I think of uh, in this particular one for King and uh, Kanata. But also look again, look at the idea of indigenous participation throughout history. And in the First World War and the Second World War, indigenous troops would often come back home and face the racism that they thought, you know, had been, you know, by participating in the military. So that's a very interesting area that I find as well, that uh, what occurred, and there's been a lot of research and films, uh, Loretta Todd, uh, Forgotten Warriors, uh, and such. And it also brings up, you know, sort of other sort of issues of conflict within our country, and Oka comes to mind when military was brought in. How do we as a society or individuals within the military unpack that? And how do we sort of think about those things in our time. So I think these are interesting questions, and they're definitely questions we have to consider as, as we move forward in, in, in time. A few more images from the installations. This was the uh, Chinook helicopter. I got to draw on, well actually the first one was on paper that I attached to the wall, and the second one I was able to draw right onto the wall. <laughs> so as an artist, that's the best thing to do when you get to draw on walls, to do that. Uh, this was at the Grunt Gallery installation. Uh, the front one there I called uh, Sandbox. And uh, you know uh, the theater of war and that, uh, and that was actually one of the terms that I heard quite often about Afghanistan. It was called the sandbox, and so using the razor wire around there, around it, because you know you often think of child's play and how often as young children, war became a very part of that play as a young person, and so how that translates, I find interesting. Also did a four-channel again, as I mentioned earlier, four-channel video installation some of the photography. So these were all just basically installation shots. And uh, then I also did a piece uh, called Memory. And this was a memorial to the fallen Canadian soldiers. And the idea of memory, and how through time memory fades. So always one of the things that, you know, the, uh, the importance of remembrance day and remembering. Uh, and it's also that, that sort of struggle that I have about memory is that if we truly remembered, we wouldn't forget, and that maybe conflict wouldn't happen. You know, that, that's a bit more of an altruistic sort of feeling. But I think that that's you know, one of the things that, sadly, I think we do forget. And so that's one of the things I thought about uh, when I did that, that particular piece. So yeah, so that's holding our breath, 
And, uh, and then since then, uh, as well, I've been uh, actually did a, um, a war monument to the War of 1812 uh, with the Whitecap Dakota First Nation in examining their history uh, with uh, the Canadian, or at that time, the British military. Uh, during the War of 1812, and so we did this piece in Saskatoon, which honored uh, their um, uh, historical phys uh, uh, figures, Chief Wabashaw, uh, Colonel Robert Dixon from the Canadian side, and Colonel Robert Dixon married uh, a uh, Dakota woman, Totoan, and she uh, and they, they sort of created their, their life together. So, uh, so as you can see, my work continues on in, in, in sort of the, in these with these histories. And uh, Prince Edward came and uh, <laughs> unveiled it, which was kind of fun. Mind you, they made us bump up three weeks to get done for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, massacre sites, this was from, uh, I went down to Australia and uh, droned uh, uh, the uh, Athen Massacre site film because nobody can actually get into it because it's privately owned and the owner just refuses anybody's access. And so I did that, but I juxtaposed it with the Cypress Hills Massacre in Canada. So I call that as above, so below. Again, looking at uh, historical uh, conflict and war. And then for Bimmy, uh, most recently with the Canadian military, uh, or the uh, military museums in Calgary, I did a, a series of performances, and this one was called Trench. I was on commemorating Bimmy, and 100th anniversary of Bimmy, and so I went in and I was doing research, and of course, trench warfare it was forefront in a lot of my research. And I started to think, well, what would it actually be like to build a trench in that manner? And so I did a duration performance from sunrise to sunset for five days, and I dug one of these trenches on my first nation. And, uh, and then we, and then I had uh, our elders be involved, and, and, and then it was interesting, a lot of people from Calgary, uh, the uh, Canadian uh, Forces personnel came out every now and then to visit. And so again, making those interesting connections. And then also just community in general and, and youth from my nation. who, when they came to help me sort of dig and be there, I was able to sort of uh, pass on historical information about our own soldiers, such as Yellowfly and Wolfleg and Stimson and all these people who had participated in the war. And so in essence, it became a teaching tool uh, for them to understand their own history and why I was doing this. And this was in, really an honor of Michael Mountain Horse as well. But I also said this for all the soldiers. Who were, who were a part of that conflict. And this is our elder, uh, Clarence uh, Wolflake, who I'm, I'm very close to, uh, who guides me quite often, uh, who's a spiritual leader. And this was another interesting thing that is very interesting, is that often warriors uh, become our spiritual people on uh, First Nations. And his father, um, Mark Wolflake, was in uh, the First World War. And Mark was a well-respected uh, medicine person on our, our First Nation and uh, certainly uh, provided me with a lot of uh, wisdom and guidance throughout the process. And then this little performance I worked on uh, at the very end of it. So I will stop there. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so again, you know, it's just a snapshot. Uh, certainly, uh, my investigation can go in many different ways, or did go in a number of different ways, but at the core of it really was the Indigenous participation for which I'm still, uh, still uh, doing research on, and that, uh, that at some point will uh, further sort of uh, fill out as I move through, and uh, through it, and, and come to know more uh, about uh, that participation, and uh, sort of add to that historical sort of knowledge and history. And so I find that uh, to be not only a place of privilege and honor, and uh, is, is important, important for all of us to understand. So with that, I thank you so much for listening to me, and I believe we now have time for questions. <laughs> Edwin, we have 15, 20 minutes for questions, so I'll, I'll let you lead the uh, the discussion. Before we start, I have to say one thing. 